So Dr. Biles is my dentist. He practices in Santa Cruz, California with a biological holistic approach and is currently a member of the Academy of General Dentistry, the California Dental Association, the American Dental Association, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Tech, uh, Toxicology, and the International Academy of Biology and Medicine, and holds fellowships in the Academy of General Dentistry and the Institute of Natural Dentistry. Born and raised intermittently on the Presidio of San Francisco, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa in 1975 from UC Davis with degrees in psychology and physical education while working for the UCD Law School, Campus Police Department, most importantly, the Human Performance Laboratory, Government Subsidized Exercise Physiology Lab Laboratory. Abandoning sports psychology as a career objective, Dr. Biles switched directions in graduate school and began pursuing a hard science path towards a PhD in exercise physiology. He earned a Regents Fellowship for his research on cardiovascular drift, completing his studies with 55 units more than necessary to achieve his degree. Um, Dr. Biles is going to talk to us about bridging medicine and dentistry today. Please welcome Dr. David Biles. <clears throat> thank you, Robert. Appreciate um, you inviting me here, and I, I want to thank especially Robert for having me here. He's been kind of persistent with me coming, and uh, what an opportunity and honor to be here with Raymond. Um, I fully support what he has to say here uh, with his books. It, the diseases are very simple. It is really uh, malfunctioning cells. So I thought what I would do tonight was try to share some things with you that I've learned in the process of becoming a dentist. And, and a lot of this, because I'm not an author, I'd like to come from a place where you kind of get a, a sense of significant events in my life that have led me to believe what I believe. Okay? I, I would start with this. Most of you feel that this is somewhat of a spiritual journey you're on. You ever thought about that? I mean, I, I finally come to believe that I'm really not in control and I never ever was in control. And when I go back and, and spend time looking at myself, and I've probably done too much of that, if you're a psych major, usually it's because you want to know about yourself and your family. And that's kind of where I started. And what I've come to learn about myself is that I just enjoy learning. And um, I didn't go down the science route initially because I had such bad experiences at one time. So um, I wanted to start out, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, and um, you know, I, 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 when I first saw this, I thought about this too, because um, even though I'm up here speaking and, and I, I feel very strongly about some of the things I say, it's with a great deal of humility that I say them. Um, and I hope tonight I don't shrink from what I want to say, because I have a couple staff members here, and they've heard me say a lot of things repetitively, and I hope that some of that comes out tonight for you, because um, it makes it, it, makes it uh, more interesting for me. So... Um, uh, I hope that I can help inspire you too. So I'm, I want to start this journey um, with just this here, is that you have to realize you've got to change with what you're doing. And that's one of the things that I've been uh, with. Um, so I, I mentioned to you that uh, I was a physical education major. It saddens me that Bill Cosby um, has become, we've become aware of Bill Cosby, what he is, because I always thought this was such a great album when I grew up. And I never wanted to be a PE major. And, uh, you know, there I was. Uh, I went to school. My parents, my 18th year was really rough. My, my grandmother died. My dad sold the house, moved out of San Jose, left me here. And I was already going to, going to go to school. So I just stayed in school. And I thought I was going to go to school and play baseball and go to law school. Uh, and never wanted to be thought of as a dumb jack, jock, but uh, ultimately I went there, and I'll explain why more a little bit later. Uh, many of you may not know this, but, but Paul Revere was actually a dentist. And I've often thought, wow, <laughs> what an interesting parallel, Paul Revere, a dentist. And I thought, well, how is it that, that he, and I quiz people on this, do you know what Paul Revere was? And some, most kids don't have any clue what he was. I thought he was a silversmith. And, and I thought, when I discovered he was a dentist, I thought, wow, wouldn't the dental profession really want to embellish that? But they don't. 
And so, um, uh, you know, I, I also thought, well, why did he know all this stuff? Well, a lot of people come to you when you're a dentist. So you get to hear from the left, the right, the rich, the poor, everybody. And if you're listening, you can really learn a lot. So that's where it was. So I, I grew up in the Army. I'm going to go through a bunch of things. My dad was a medic in the Army. It was great to hear this from you. And, and my earliest memories are from Hawaii when we were living there in the 50s. My dad worked at Tripler. And I recall one day asking him where he went every day. Uh, I, this is preschool for me. I have, because of all the moves, I'll tell you, I went to 13 schools. I had, I can just throw a few things. I had eight band directors. I mean, I moved a lot. A and how you assimilate with that, or I did, and my brother did, we were, we were very good athletes, and, and we had other skills that came along. And so we were readily accepted. And as we got older, uh, other things came about. But anyway, I asked my dad one day, I said, where do you go every day, Dad? I mean, I'm here at home with, with uh, Stephen and Mom, and you're gone. And he goes, well, I go to this big hospital up there, and I work there. And this is really huge. You can hardly see it now because it's grown up all around it. But the one time, it was just like that. So he told me, he said, I help people every day. They live in little boxes. And I go, what do you mean they live in little boxes? He goes, well, they're in these things called iron lungs. And, and, and he was helping polio patients. And I couldn't imagine somebody being in, an, in, in a little box all day long. But that's what he did. And, and so he would go there and take care of that. And I thought, I thought at the time, I thought, wow, I'd sure like to help a lot of people get well so they don't have to live in little boxes, you know, how terrible that must be. Well, we moved from Hawaii, and then we moved to, back to San Francisco. And San Francisco seemed to be the, um, the place we went a lot. This is, oh, good, the laser's here. So this is the old San Francisco in the 60s. The Embarcadero's not there. This is really Chrissy Field. And my dad used to work, I think, right down here. Um, and they kept a couple of medics there all the time because they actually had an airfield there. And if anybody crashed, that's what they were there for. Um, and so anyway, so we were there. On the, by the time we left the Presidio, I'd gone to three different schools. And then we moved to um, Arkansas, which I don't show. And I was there for the second grade. Then we moved to Paris. And it's really interesting because I've come to wonder if I didn't go through some formal brainwashing as well. Because we were in Paris from the third, fourth, and fifth grade during the 60s when Kennedy was killed. And uh, we had no television. No television. We got radio two hours a week on Saturday evening. I got to listen to Gunsmoke and the Grand Ole Opry. And so you, know, you learn to create images in your head. It's a whole different experience um, that, you, that the kids are not getting today. Well, anyway, we were there. At, this is my brother, and uh, he got to go back. I haven't been back yet. I want to go, but we haven't made it back. Well, while we were there, um, I happened to catch the, um, you notice the four stars there? Uh, so on that day, I caught the, the baseball opening day, and I became famous for the first time in my life. And this picture was all over Europe in um, the Stars and Stripes. So I still have the ball. Uh, that's Kevin Dougherty looking on. I've looked at the, the um, caption forever. After we left France, we moved to Texas. And this is the fifth grade. I walked into this class in Texas, and this kid stands up. You notice, this is interesting. She, this is Mrs. Yates. She was my fifth grade teacher, and then later she went to junior high, and she was there my two years. But she put Michael Salvin in the front. I'm in the back in the last Aloha shirt I can wear. Michael stands up and waves hi to me when I walk in the door. He was one of my best friends in France. And, you know, and this was an interesting thing, too. This is one of the schools I didn't assimilate too well in. But um, yeah, it was, it was, I've had a lot of experiences like that, seeing people from other places in my life. That'll come up. Um, my dad got us in the band. I'm here, my brother's somewhere else. We used to march here. This is a junior high band. And um, that's where you do in Texas. We did halftime shows and things like that. Again, a different education. I feel sorry for the kids today. Um, this was um, a great opportunity. Well, I, I was pretty good. While I was there, by the way, three years in France, and then in Texas, this is where they, they trained all the helicopter pilots for the Vietnam War. And so there were three or 400 helicopters in the air every day. Um, 
And my brother and I, I think because of the opportunities that we had in, in France, we distinguished ourselves and the faculty chose us to be on the student council and people mentored us actively. And so as, I, as, I, as I've grown older and began to look back at this, I realized how fortunate I was that my name started with B because I sat in the front row most of the time. And, and that was really critical because I'm talking to the teacher at this level constantly. And because I was bright, I didn't know that, but I was, they engaged and I engaged and I asked a lot of questions and, and, and that had a lot of impact as I later discovered. So after we left Texas, I was so brainwashed <laughs> and indoctrinated there that um, I moved to, so anybody here, you guys are local, I'm sort of local, anybody here go to Homestead High School at all? My son did. Your son did. Okay, so I'm at Homestead High School now. And, and um, I, go to I went to Homestead High School. I was one of four freshmen in the marching band. And uh, we were featured, a, a few weeks ago, they did an article in the Chronicle on them. We were featured in the Chronicle uh, as uh, the fastest band in the West. And there we were. And actually, I'm over here. There's the other bass clarinet. But just as to prove to my kids that I actually did play in the band, and I'm marching there. That was quite an experience at Homestead. And this woman here I'll bring up in a moment, this was one of my history teachers. Homestead, if, for those of you who know, Wozniak was a senior when I was there, and Jobs was a year behind me. And so, and I only stayed at this school three quarters of a year. This woman was one of my history teachers. They took, taught a world history class with, um, I'm gonna get the dentistry, I promise. Um, but, they, but this is kind of key to me because I, I'll tell you the story now. Ten years after I left Homestead, I attended another junior high in San Francisco, Marina Junior High. I went to Lowell High School, and then I moved from there to, to Oak Grove High School. Then I went to UC Davis for four years of college, two years of grad school. One year I'm working as an exercise physiologist. Now I'm walking into the basement of the medical school at UCLA to pay for my physical exam. I can't make these stories up. I wish I could, but they're real. And the cashier asked me if I'd gone to high school in Cupertino. And I said, well, yeah, I, I, yeah. It was kind of an odd question. She said, you take a history. She said, where'd you go? I go, Homestead. She goes, you take a history class. I go, yeah. I explained the history class because they had combined four freshman classes and grouped us all together and made it very dramatic. And then we had three teachers co-teaching us. And I named all three of them, Mr. Fulcher, Mr. Crump, Mr. Thuey. And she says, I'm Mr. Thuey. And I remember you because I sat in the front row and I asked questions all the time. And I did the same thing in dental school too. And I never realized the impact I had on everyone around me because of that. Um, and it's just, you know, and, and I realized that too, when you go to a school and you grow up in a community, other forces will shut you down. But I was, I had the benefit of teachers that were mentoring me and helping me. And, and I don't think kids get that experience. So I was really grateful for the travel. It took a long time. What happened next? Oh, yeah. If any of you happen to know Jim Plunkett, um, I had a lot of great mentors. I even got to play quarterback. And um, this gentleman mentored Jim Plunkett and me. Um, it was my football coach. And he introduced me, really, to athletics and administration and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of sort of the story, too, because while I played football at Oak Grove, I wore two body casts. And part of the experience I have in, in dentistry has to do with my experience in medicine, too. So I broke my collarbone in half, was carried off the field on a stretcher on Halloween night, 1969. Hard to forget that night at, at Good Sam in San Jose. The following year, I broke my shoulder in the second game of the season, was misdiagnosed in the Presidio, played the entire season with a broken shoulder, and um, was misdiagnosed with cancer, and then um, had surgery on my shoulder. If my shoulder looks kind of weird, it's because of the Army surgery when I'm 18 at Letterman. So I spend a week on a ward with amputated soldiers. I grew up in this hospital. I was born in this hospital. And now I'm going in. I think I'm going to lose my arm. 
Um, fortunately, I didn't. Um, this was the night I broke my collarbone in half. This kind of interesting picture, I want to throw this out too because it was a transition for me. So now I go to college and all this stuff happens and you might find this interesting. Here, finally won a championship. We didn't do it at Oak Grove, but I'm in the middle here. This guy was at my high school. This guy was at my high school at Oak Grove. This guy's a physician. He went to Lowell High School. I used to see him all the time. This guy's a professor. This guy here's my best friend. It says Corleone on him. He retired as the chief executive marketing director of Merck. <laughs> Took the pictures at my wedding. So during my grad school time at Davis, working in the Human Performance Laboratory, I came into contact with a lot of interesting personalities. I went to school with three Olympic athletes. Mr. Iron Man was a classmate of mine, and on and on and on. Um, the, some guy who just ran for uh, mayor in um, Santa Barbara was one of the subjects in my master's thesis. It was, a, it was a hotbed of activity athletically and everything. Matter of fact, several of the coaches out there, the, the Oregon football coach, Mike Bellotti, was, um, I helped assist him. When I, when I got in the master's program, I decided to go down the physiology route over something really strange. And I had to just totally reverse myself. The PE major at UC Davis was very academic, and they have now eliminated it. Sadly, they just closed the department. Um, you could go down a psychological route and learn how to take care of people and motivate and this and that. And, I, and that's what I did as an undergraduate. Or you could go the physiological route, which was essentially pre-med on steroids. And I didn't want to do that. I wasn't interested in becoming a physician. I didn't want to be a dentist. Um, and frankly, I had a lot of disdain for pre-meds and pre-dental students there. Um, they drove me crazy with their colored pens, blue, red, green, black, you know, just like everybody was anal about getting grades. I just decided, you know, I, I, I just worked hard. So anyway, the path I went down was very different than pre-med. And I took, and this is significant to me when I look back at it, and this is why I'm going to tell you some of the things I will tell you. I'm telling you this so I can establish some authority with you, having not done any writing in terms of books. So you go down PH, you go down, they take biochemistry. This was a real good example of the PhD route. I'm taking human biochemistry, which is just all about humans, and most of your pre-med people take a general biochemistry class, which includes plants. I know nothing about plants, um, but I know a lot more about humans. This was my mentor. Now, when I went to dental school, I was there for four years, and I can tell you that only one instructor spent an hour with me one-on-one. -on -one. This gentleman, Dr. Adams, gave me four years of his life and taught me how to think. And I can't tell you how grateful I am. Passed away this last year, but just uh, an amazing guy. Um, I show you this because I really was an exercise physiologist at Northridge Hospital. I worked there five years in the ICU. And um, they trained me to do a lot of things. This was a 350-bed hospital, bigger than anything in Santa Cruz. We had, I don't know, I worked in the pulmonary department, respiratory care. I had a lot of different duties. I think I put them up on one of them, yeah. Um, I did ABGs, I did pulmonary exams. When the first heart patients started, I did all the pulmonary exams on them. I was part of the uh, cardiac rehab care too. And so I'm tracking in medicine. Matter of fact, out of my department, I'm the only one in pulmonary medicine, everybody else in cardiology. And so I didn't, even then I wasn't thinking about becoming a doctor, but I'd been on a hiring committee at the university for a professor, and I was so disgusted with the nepotism over the hiring process that I said, I'm out of here. My college roommate was in dental school, and as I'll share with you later, I had some dental issues, so I went that way. That's when I saw Mr. Thuey again. So this is what I looked like in dental school. They were a little worried about me. I had long hair and wore Birkenstocks. And um, I, another thing will come up. I, I guess he, I, I, I thought I had these. I don't know, are these in order? Oh, they are. Well, you know, I tell you, here's the spiritual part. When I was a child, I had two teeth that refused, and it created a lot of trouble for me. I had constant headaches. I, I, nutrition was bad. In those days, the, everything was canned, and it was just bad anyway. 
but I was constantly sick and uh, headaches and earaches, and I never got well till my tonsils were taken out, and I lost that tooth. I come to understand now the effect of the tooth, so I didn't like to smile. And then when I had to smile, this is, sorry for this picture, it got ruined. This is the embassy in Paris, and I'm there in the middle with the Cub Scouts, but I'm trying to like put a smile out there and not show my teeth. And, and then as I got older, I, well, you kind of have to show your teeth, you know, and I, I just, everyone said you got a great smile, but God, my teeth were crooked, really bugged me. And that's my high school graduation one. Well, uh, we were talking about braces, one of the gentlemen here, and I'll tell you, I always wanted straighter teeth, and I think that also led me to dentistry. And um, I eventually got braces. I went through eight years of braces with two different, or three different orthodontics, and I had jaw surgery, too. I would not do that again. Now, I bring this guy's picture up because he's always, I've been intrigued by him for a long time. Second year of dental school. What happens when you go to dental school and medical school is everybody goes and they have prerequisites that they have to meet in order to be accepted in the school. But nobody really knows how strong the program is that you went to. I mean, you could have an A, but you know, the school's not that good. Or you could have a C. So what happens is uh, you get to school and they, you, you take all these exams that um, let, the, let, let's let the faculty know where the class is at. Okay. So um, this guy comes in our second year, uh, and um, he obviously hadn't heard something about me before because he's the only professor outside of the 10 years of college I was at where someone made an effort to learn everybody's name, with the exception of the PE department, which was rather small. And um, after he, st he started calling people by name out of the audience because he'd memorized the class um, the class picture, and he got most everybody right. And then out of the blue, he says, for the life of me, I can't understand why they accepted a PE major into this class. <laughs> God was, I can't, I, you know, really, I won't even repeat what I was thinking because I was so ups I was so pissed off, I can't begin to tell you. Here's why. Not only had I been working in an ICU two years, at the time with a very responsible position, but when I got to that school, I took the physiology exam, and I tell you this with all humility, but this is, this, it took me 35 years to really understand this. I got called up to the department chair at the physiology department, and I was informed that I had scored higher on the exam than anybody in the existence of the school over 20 years. Nobody in the school had scored as high as I had ever on that exam. And it was a piece of cake for me. It was really easy. And it should have been. I had been teaching physiology. I'd been working it. I mean, I, I knew it. And, um, and they said, but you're going to have to take the class anyway. We won't pass you out. Now, this was really significant because it later, this is why I cannot talk to some of my colleagues. They don't get it. When you take the same class four years in a row, you really get it. We got two quarters of physiology in dental school, the same class the medical school students took, by the way, same instructors, two quarters. I had five or six years of it. I learned nothing new in dental school about physiology. And, and you have, and, and I, I come to think too, this will sound a little biased, but honestly, exercise physiologist, a real good one who's really schooled, knows the body well. They have to know how, and I'll get into some of that in a moment, but they have to know how the body works at altitude, at sea level, supine, prone, old, young, male, female, kids, you know, all that. In the water, at, at altitude, what does it do acutely, chronically? You learn how the systems work, and you learn that stress leads to an adaptation. And that's key. So this guy bugged me. I'm still trying. He may still be alive. So... I'm really a systems man, by the way, Raymond. <laughs> and um, this is how I see stuff. The body is a system. Um, and all these systems are regulated. Now, I'm going to give you a preview here. Um, I wrote this when I was in dental school. And I have a paper trail that'll show everything. I completed my master's thesis 
for UC Davis my senior year in dental school at UCLA while I'm working in the ICU. And this is what I was doing. I'm learning about disease and, and disturbances. But, and, and the key is, is to understand systems. And I, don't, I won't bore you with this because I know it's late and I'm, I'm coming on. But when, you're, when you were doing what I had to do, you had to understand how the body was working at the molecular level, at the gross level, all these different levels. And that's just not the way that dentists are taught to think necessarily. And so, you know, I can give you a lesson on that too, but this would just take us into it. But the bottom line was, is this is the sort of background I, I was working with. Um, I show this picture too because at this point, now I'm finally working in dentistry. I'm really into high tech. I want to be one of the good old boys because I've never been a good old boy moving from all the schools I go to. Here's an opportunity to meet with people. I'll say one other thing here too, not to step on toes, and I think dentists are great, but I believe there's a difference between dental schools that are public and private. And I say that having attended graduation at both of them. There's a very different demographic scene. And I'll leave it at that for now. Um, and who knows what retribution might be. But I also show this picture because I try to walk the talk that I give. And what disturbed me for the longest time growing up was that um, I had acne I couldn't get rid of. Well, I'll tell you, I got rid of the acne when the mercury was gone, okay? And mercury's playing a big role for a lot of people, and it does cause that. So that's a reminder to me. And again, I wanted to be a good old boy, but I really had trouble. Now, I did want to be a good old boy. Matter of fact, I got a couple of awards from the California Dental Association uh, before they kind of, I became a persona non gratis. Uh, so two years at the state level, I get awards. And then we had the fluoride issue in, in, um, in Santa Cruz. I went to San Diego. This is where I met David Kennedy. And this is when I quit using fluoride toothpaste. I knew I'd been lied to. And it was very easy because I took all those pre-med and pre-dental courses when I'm in my 20s, not when I'm 18. And I'd already worked in a human research lab where I'm calibrating mass spectrometers, gas analyzers. I'm having to do the science before I actually even understand it. And then I learn the science, and then I understand it even better. So you get a working knowledge of it. And um, so there's no, there's no fluoride in the water in um, Santa Cruz County. And I've been part of really a handful of people that have made that happen. And um, when the Watsonville people had the issue with it, um, it was really a soul searcher because I had to stand up and, and speak against 12 of my colleagues and friends. And I really believe that fluoride's bad. And so, um, interestingly enough, except for the Watson, by the time I did Watsonville, I was like not part of the leadership anymore. Because I introduced a resolution in 2006 to educate the leadership of the California Dental Association about mercury. And they quit inviting me back. <laughs> okay. So in fact, this is what they said. You know, they lost the Santa Cruz vote by 73 votes. This comes out of a newsletter in, in, uh, and, um, in Northern California. And, and I'm the board member who, uh, in fact, when I saw David Kennedy, I went back and I said, hey, we all have to learn this because we've been misled. And they said, yeah, we should invite him here. Next meeting, they said, oh, we can't invite David. Well, why? Because he doesn't support the position of the American Dental Association. And I said, well, shouldn't we try that? I bring this up. This is my mom, who also had her own sort of dental problems. But my mother was the first one that told me she believed her teeth was making her ill. My mother died at 59. I know that army medicine and everything led to her early demise. Uh, and I could go into examples, but I won't. Now we're going to get more dental, and I'm going to bridge a little bit more. So um, about three months ago, this gentleman came into my office. His name's Devin. Um, you don't have to know much to look at this and go, wow, that doesn't look normal. You know, what's going on here? Well, let me tell you. This is right side, left side. These things here are all teeth with root canals. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
this is a huge abscess. That's an abscess. All these teeth are broken off and decayed. He'd just been diagnosed with acute lymphocytic le leukemia, and his family brought him in to see me. And why I've learned what I've learned is because I've had a number of people bring people to me who are nearly dead. And, and I can go into some of those, too. I don't have a lot of pictures. Um, I figured that since I'm more or less second string or you know, coming in late here, you can invite me back for a longer session, and I'll, I'll get in more details if you want sometimes. But here's the key. His family brought him to me because they realized, as sick as he was, if they put him through the chemotherapy that they want to do, there was no way he was going to survive. So I took out all of his teeth and put in dentures and monitored him and worked with him for two weeks before he went off to the hospital. And I had a heck of a time stopping the bleeding here. I got to tell you, that was, that was a chore. But everything was working really well. Well, if you think medicine and dentistry work together, um, that's an illusion. You know, maybe in a few places, and it does happen in a few places, but in general, doesn't really happen, okay? So um, I went up to visit him because I was really concerned. I knew that he was, you know, I told the family how to manage it and blah, 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 blah. So I go up on a Saturday, a week after his third weekend, and um, I wanted to reline his dentures because he'd been healing, and uh, I was concerned I had sutures, and I told them, this is how you got to do it, blah, blah, blah. Well, the physicians didn't want the denture in the mouth. The denture works as a Band-Aid at that stage of healing. You need to leave it in the mouth. And so um, they had issue with that. When I went up to see them, it was kind of like really strange how they were treating me and this and that. And, but I kind of went along with whatever because he was asleep. We couldn't do much at the time. I came back the following week, and he was uh, asleep. He's up at the, the UC Davis Sac Medical Center. And um, I went back on Sunday to see him because he was asleep on Saturday. When I got to his room, it was cleaned out. And it's interesting how hospital jargon comes back to you right away. And, and I asked the nurse if he had expired. That's what we use in the hospital. Had, had, he, had the guy in this room expired, she goes, oh, no, no, he's in the ICU. So, oh, great, where's that? So I went to the ICU, and um, they haven't changed much. In the, in, it's been like 35 years since I've worked in one now. And um, it, was, it was kind of interesting to visit, but, but the, the doctor came up to me, and I'd already met her once, and he was already out of it. There was nothing I could do at that point. And, and I said to her, I said, you know, are you a second or third year resident? Because you know, Davis is teaching hospital, Stanford's a teaching hospital. And she says to me, I'm a second year resident. I go, oh, great. Now, this was in August. Um, this is kind of an open-ended question, but do you guys know what that means? Yep. Second year resident, August. You got it? You don't want to be in the hospital for long. Yeah. I will tell you, that means she's been out of medical school one year and one month. Okay? Because in July, you don't want to go to the hospital, the teaching hospital, because everybody turns over on July 1. It took me three years to figure that out at, at Northridge. <laughs> New nurses came in every July 1, you know? New doctors. Every, and it's chaos. It's totally chaos. So anyway, so I asked her that, and she told me, so I go, oh boy, she's in charge of his life, is what I'm thinking. But that's how they learn, that's how we learn, that's how it's learned. And, um, and I said to her, I said, you know, our interaction here may only be a footnote for you in your career, but I want to ask you a question here. And I showed her this x-ray, I brought a copy of the x-ray to her. I said, how many people on this floor have been diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia that have a dental profile like this. Do you know? Do you have any idea what their mouths look like? She goes, no. I said, do you have a, is there a dentist working in the hospital? Well, we have one that comes in every day. I go, oh, is he an oral surgeon? She goes, yeah. I go, great. Not the right kind of person in my book, but 
the point of it was to me, and here's where I want to make a bridge. I'm in charge of the biggest hole in your body, the, the health of you know, your body. Every dentist is. And that guy that's working on the other end of the food chain there, he doesn't have to deal with teeth. They're not near the brain. He doesn't have to deal with gravity, personality, and he's an MD. Now, honestly, I don't care that I'm an MD or a DDS. I remember hearing this one guy up in Tacoma. He said, well, why don't you become a, an MD? He said, what, give up all my power as a dentist? And I thought, you know, that guy's right. So I'll get through this quickly, but I gotta tell you, here's where the big, here's where the big thing's missing. There is no way any physician in this country should be diagnosing anything without something like this to correlate. Because I'll tell you right now, the way I practice dentistry, I do stuff, I wait for people to come back and they tell me what's going on and I've been blown away by it. I've taken this tooth out. This all sound anecdotal, I'm sorry. I, that, you know, if anybody sees this and they wanna fund me for research, I'd just love it and I want a big sign it bonus too because that freed me up a bit. But I've taken this tooth out 14 times, and every patient has come back to me and told me their atrial fib is gone. Okay? Now, how is that possible? Well, see, nobody wants to think about mechanisms, but they're there. Oh, here's another one. I won't go through a lot of these, but here's another one. Can you see this big ball here? It's kind of hard. This is a root canal, too. See that? And there's this big bony ball connected to it, and this is a root canal, and that's a root canal. This is my dental assistant's father. He had a stroke a month ago. They just took him out of Stanford. He's now going through rehab. He's 47 years old. We didn't get to him quick enough. During the time he's at Stanford, he has this infection, and they can't locate it anywhere. Oh, God, how are we going to get this infection? We can't get it under control. I happened, I'm like in New York at the time this is going on. I called my dental assistant. I said, take this x-ray, take a copy, send it on your phone, take it to Stanford, tell them. They have oral surgeons there. Tell them, look, he's got an infected mouth. Nothing happened. Okay? So, teaching hospital. So, you know, it's like we have to remember that this is the way things work and cells have to come in. I don't want to go to too much of this, but let me give you some normal stuff here too. This is what you should have, 32 teeth. But what we're not paying attention to is the context of where the mouth is. So what I tell people, and this was an example I was going to give you, is that, you know, um, you've got this skull, the teeth are there, but, and there's muscles and what have you, but this is kind of key here. There's a lot of structures around these teeth. And right up here is your pituitary gland. Down here is your thyroid gland. So, you know, this is kind of how I see it. When I was an exercise physiologist doing my studies, I was looking at cardiovascular drift. And, and what that is is when someone's exercising a long period of time, um, the workload doesn't change, but the heart rate starts going up, and they don't know why, or they didn't know why. At the time, there were 20 studies out. Now they're all over the place. You also discover that when you do studies like this for the government, it, it leads to other research. They're looking for people that do stuff like that. So anyway, your thyroid and your pituitary, or pituitary thyroid, th these are wireless remotes. They're controlling your body. And when you've got forces in between, see, the laws of nature don't change, you know? You get electricity here, you get poisons, you get all sorts of stuff, and it drains or just affects. And I discovered that um, accidentally. So there's your wireless remote, the, the pituitary and, and the thyroid, but then you got your brain, another remote, and it's wired to everything. So, how is it possible that teeth can affect the heart? Well, it's really simple. It's affecting the cells. The laws of nature. I'll show you some real, real life examples here in a moment. But you know, you look at this, all these cranial nerves, there's, there's, there's 12 here, 24 cranial nerves in your head. You know, if you have an impacted tooth, there's another thing I learned. I'll, I'll show you this real quickly. Yeah, I got one minute, huh? Oh boy. 
I better hustle. <laughs> Let me show you some teeth then. Okay. So that was key back there. This is what the Chinese have taught me again. I start looking at other systems of why we have what we have. So do you know what I really treat? I don't treat teeth. I treat the nervous system. The nervous system is nothing but a bunch of wires. I'm treating the wire caps. That's what teeth are. They're the ends of the wires. And we got all sorts of wire caps. They decay, they rot, they break, and they make teeth. This is to tell you that in the most basic sense of the way, you know where you get cavities? The belly buttons of teeth. Really, truly. I try to teach, this is the PE major in me, I try to teach from analogy so it makes sense. Where you trap stuff and don't clean it out, teeth rot. The first cavities start in the grooves and the pits and fissures. They're microscopic, you can't clean them out. So we seal them for children. The second decay comes in between. But if you keep, keep it clean, you don't have trouble. I also sometimes tell people that their jaws are like uh, egg cartons. When you take out some teeth, there's still some bone and the bone like uh, is working out. So let's move, oh, here's another thing too. You guys have seen this before, you know how I view this? See those holes? Those are all the nerves go through, right? This is where the spinal cord goes through. You know what that is? That's a circuit board. Got it? That's a circuit board. Now you start influencing with teeth the circuit board, the regulation of the system that's so way far away gets messed up. How can we be doing medicine when we're not looking at this, really? So here's another thing. I, I bring this up to remind me that I realized you want to know about education? I will tell you that, in my opinion, dentists and physicians, and I can at least speak for dentists, they're misinformed, un undereducated, and brainwashed, and lied to. Why this? I took anatomy in two different medical schools, UC Davis and UCLA, and um, we were told that the skull, these sutures here, nothing moves. It's a solid, well, it's not solid, it's a hollow core. And um, that's a lie. Can you give me like five more minutes? I'll, I'll run you through real quickly. Okay, hard cut. Okay, here you go. Sorry, this is a little bit red. That's a root canal tooth. When that tooth came out, that's what it looked like. Okay, is that inert? No. Okay, that's how dark the tooth went. Okay. This we just did the other day, same patient. This is internal resorption near the nerve. We started the prep, bleeding right away. We took, had to take the tooth out. Got a big cavitation back here, which you can see right there. That's been affecting his health. There's the root canal that went. I took this tooth out, this root canal out. Woman jumped up out of the, out of the chair and said, oh my God, I see better. I go, really? Yeah, this has happened three times. Can't make it up. So what's happening? Pressure on the optic nerve from this relieved as soon as the extraction happens. Um, this is Amanda. Oh, I got to show you this one too. See those two root canals? Third root canal, fourth root canal. This is Tony A. I put Tony into remission from Lou Gehrig's disease for a year by removing these root canals, which led me to believe that it's a big bacterial infection. And then this is just a bunch of before and after amalgam mercury things. So the take home lesson tonight would be is from what I can tell you, and here we go again, this metal is leaching into the tissue, you know, and, and what does that do to our bodies? You get rid of the metal and um, you have a different presentation. So let me just buzz through here quickly, denture. That's an overdenture. Again, one thing interesting about all our bodies, once all the teeth come out, Everything forms just like that anyway. That's the upper jaw with the denture out. That's, that's a partial denture, or it's a denture over denture with gold. Um, we're too, I wanted to show you others. We're obviously not going to finish. I wanted to show you normal, healthy. This happens to be my cousin. She's 57 years old. She has really healthy mouth, almost no restorations, uh, really great shape. 
I would have gotten into tongue, but there's, there's more than I could possibly teach you. The bottom line is, is that you can't ignore the mouth with the rest of the body. I could go into breathing and all sorts of stuff, but my time is there. Um, probably handle a few questions. Uh, maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> one question. What yeah. about breathing? Breathing. What about breathing was a question. What do you mean by breathing? Well, you mentioned it. Okay, I You mentioned it, it. Okay. We know over-breathing is not good, but maybe that's not what you're talking about. No, yeah. What I discovered, I discovered something accidentally, and I haven't seen it come across anywhere. And he's got it. And that was that, you see this right here? I cut this on my, my daughter uh, with intention, and I've now done 120 of these surgeries. It's nothing new. It's old surgery. But because of my background in pulmonary medicine, I recognized, you know, you have to, have, you have to be prepared to recognize what happens. She called me the next day. What I usually say is, hey, tell me if anything happened. So she calls back and says, tell my dad I breathe better. So I had a kid in the chair. I convinced him I should do this for him too. But I put him through a pulmonary maneuver. And as soon as he, he went through maneuver, we did the surgery. He had him do the maneuver again, and what came out of his mouth was, holy shit. And, and, I, and that's what I get. I have one documented patient who came to see me real quickly. She was wasting away, couldn't gain any weight, or had been to all these doctors, blah, blah, blah. And we took the mercury out, the root canals out, still wasn't getting better. And I said, hey, Janet, let's do your tongue. We did her tongue. Long story short, she had a pulmonary exam afterwards. Her vital capacity increased 1.1 liters. That's a, that's a big Coke. Okay, She went from 2.33 to 3.44. Her lung capacity increased a half liter. That's not supposed to happen. But, and then she gained 25 pounds. Why? Healthy cell, more oxygen. Everything was beginning to work now. And I've, I've done more with this. I've written things on it. It's great for speech therapy, self-esteem. I've helped COPD patients with it. This is something that's yet to be known, learned about. All right. Uh, well, round of applause for David Biles. And we'll have to have him back again, obviously, so he'll have a little more time. All right. Thank you, David. All right. So I uh, want to thank the presenters for coming tonight. Um, the next meeting will be December. As I mentioned, we have a potluck. We're also looking for volunteers. Um, for our chair here, and uh, I think we're in need of one more board member if you're interested and have some time. Uh, keep that in mind, and um, we have to be out of here by 10 o'clock, so thank you all very much.